Best, I guess I'm supposed to use the gavel. Hello, welcome everybody to our annual meeting. Good to have everybody here. Um, before we start the, can't you read off the FedEx box? Um, before we start the, the presentations from both our secretary and our treasurer, I just wanted to mention one thing that I forgot to do yesterday, and that is the bylaw vote we're closing today. We wanted to be sure people had a chance to vote on paper. Most of you hopefully voted online. Um, but since we didn't announce that yesterday, we're going to say anybody who would like to vote on paper who has not voted online, please don't do both. Uh, if you would just, in the next 30 minutes, Bill Stein, our first vice president back there, uh, you know, write on a piece of paper, yes, no, take it back to him. Don't leave any DNA on the paper. We'll trace back who you are. No. Um, but anyway, give, give it to the bill, and we'll add those into the uh, tally that's actually coming off the system right now. They actually are just getting online to formally close the electronic voting and, and uh, collect both the votes for the bylaw and the votes for our council members. Um, great having everybody together. I thought yesterday was a good day, a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. I'm really pleased with, with how things are going. We're going to start uh, the meeting this morning. Chris is from our secretary acting secretary. Well, no, that's right. Until the end of tomorrow, she's only acting. Um, and she will uh, summarize the previous meetings and uh, do her thing. And I'm just going to sit here and read the report because you all know what I look like. So this is the minutes of the spring membership meeting, the joint Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and AAVSO conference on June 16th, 2019, was held in the student center of York, York University, Toronto, Canada. It was called to order by President Gordon Myers at 9.02 a.m. Bob Stevens gave a treasurer's report. As of March 31st, 2019, the AAVSO had $165,767 of cash and $12,997,500 in investments. The operating fund had $165,502 of revenues, which exceeded the budget for that time period by $86,502. Most of that increase came from unexpected charitable contributions. Expenses were in line with the budget for the period. The biggest difference in budgeted results was because the AAVSO only drew $200,000 from its endowment fund while budgeting for a $325,000 draw. We did not draw from the endowment for several months. Stella gave her director's report. She began by giving the role of those we lost last year. A moment of silence was held in their memory. Stella reflected on our mission. The key words are enable anyone, anywhere, and participate. We provide resources and equal opportunity way to people in a wide geographical area to take an active role in variable star science. She reminded us of our non-discrimination, non-harassment, and anti-bullying policy, which is available on the web. She introduced the council members and staff and gave credit to our valued volunteers. She also gave a report on the demographics of the organization. We had at that time about 1,110 members, 64% from the U.S. As for the observers, only 32% are from the U.S. and 52% are visual observers. Among the AAVSO science highlights, they included our partnership with the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite or TESS follow-up project searching for Earth-like planets around nearby stars. Also, the long-term monitoring of objects of interest is an example of a continuing niche for the AAVSO. AAVSO continues to be well represented in scientific publications. Stella reminded us about JAVSO and recommended a recent editorial by editor John Percy about citizen science. VSX is the backbone of what we do and currently hosts half a million objects. As we'll hear today, there's many more now. Choice course offerings continue to be developed and offered, including observing and counting sunspots. We have 27 mentors from 12 countries. Please consider being a mentor. And there are numerous manuals available in a variety of languages. Gordon summarized the work of the Strategic Planning Committee of Council and says that we've been gathering data. We've been talking to members and we hope to revitalize the AAVSO and to answer fundamental questions of where we are headed and how we can grow and diversify our organization. A Q&A period ensued on all of these issues, and the detailed responses were recorded for later consideration by Council. This process of strategic planning will take us into 2020, so please stay tuned for updates at future meetings. 
respectfully submitted Chris Larson, acting secretary. I will now turn the microphone over to our treasurer, Bob Stevens, for the treasurer's report. Good morning, everybody. Is everybody, good morning. Everybody properly caffeinated? Okay, I'm here to report on, on the asteroid I was following last night. I got new data. It looks like we have found a satellite. This is a very interesting asteroid, about seven kilometers in diameter. This satellite is maybe 250 meters. So anything else you want to know? Oh, treasure, you want the treasure sport? Let's just have Chris read back the March report and we'll change the numbers a little bit because that was a fine report there. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get into it. Let's do a deep dive into the world of debits and credits. When I interview a new staff accountant, I often ask them, what's the difference between a debit and a credit? And if the answer is anything other than the debit's the column close to the door and the credit's the column close to the window, I know they're BSing me. So, okay, so I'm going to show you some, some of those debits and credits. Um, this is what a small business owner might call a balance sheet. In the world for nonprofits, we call it a statement of financial position. Why? Because we like long terms. But it shows it's a snapshot in time as to what we own, what we owe to people as of the end of our fiscal year, in this case, which is September 30th, which is magically only, what, two something weeks ago. Well, we, the numbers are good enough. They're not re all reconciled. There's going to be some subtle changes when the auditors get into it in a couple of weeks, but it's good enough for this presentation in the big picture world of cosmology if it's within a factor of 10 is good enough right okay so what we're showing here and let me yep okay we have right now well two weeks ago $188,000 cash in the bank and we have $13,200,000 of in our investment pool the middle column by the way is the current numbers the column on the right is just the prior year for comparative purposes so you can kind of see what's going on. In addition, we've got something called fixed assets. Think our building, a few computers and things like that, and some other assets. Don't know what those are right now. And then we got those, that's all totals up to $14,600,000. We have some liabilities, about $50,000, mainly some credit card bills, some stuff like that, uh, prepaid dues that haven't been quite allocated out yet. And then, so the difference between those two numbers, assets and liabilities, is something we now call net assets, our new terminology. We're always got to be changing the terminology to keep you on your toes. Net assets are, of course, differences between asset, assets and liabilities. And we break those into several categories. We got those net assets that are without any donor restrictions. That's about 11 million bucks. And then we got some net assets with donor restrictions. And these are the various funds right here, biggest of which is the endowment fund. And that all totals up to our $14 million. Okay, so that's the balance sheet. Now, how do we get there? This is what a small business owner would call a profit and loss statement. Of course, we're gonna call it the statement of activities because we don't wanna be ambiguous here. Now, so this is the traditional viewpoint where we have revenues on the top, expenses on the bottom, and net income or loss on the, uh, on the bottom. And that, that's not really terribly useful for a not-for-profit such as ourselves, but I'm going to show you the traditional view for those that are operating small businesses out there. So we can see that we collected $350,000 of revenues in various categories, being dues, contributions, some meetings and rent, and a few other things. And then we got some money off the investment pool, and all that totals up to 688. Then we spent the money on various things, and uh, salaries is the biggest thing for us. It always has and always will be. We got some contract services, think maintaining the website and databases and that sort of stuff and a few other things. And, a, and some other costs. Now you look at this and your alarm going, whoa, wait a minute, we lost $200,000, $300,000. Don't panic. We're gonna actually show you more detail that's gonna explain that situation on the next slide. So now let's break it out by our various categories, which are now 
as I said, there are the new terminology, net assets with donor restrictions, the, endow the restricted fund, the endowment funds and things, and then the stuff we just have general use of. Now we can start to see that, well, in the, uh, the donor of restricted assets, we had a little bit of money, we spent a little bit of money, and we spent a little bit more money than we brought in, but we had money to start with, so that's okay. The endowment fund, this is what stayed in the endowment funds and in the investment pool, so to speak. And this is what came over into the general fund for usage. So now when we look at operations, we say, aha, we brought in 600,000, we spent 971, we got a $300,000 loss. That's terrible, right? No, not really, hold on, let's go to the next slide. So keep your eye on the ball here, this column, what we just have for general operations, I'm, let's break that out. And that's gonna be here. Um, okay, they were, they were editing my slide last night and this shouldn't have stayed up that way, but ignore that. So this column is the one we were just looking at. This is the budget and this is the difference, okay. And we can see that, well, hey, we brought in more dues than expected. That's great, Gordon was shown yesterday, our membership is up all is well. Um, contributions, we got some unexpected bequests this year, wonderful, we collected 300, 100,000 more than we had hoped. Um, meetings, well, the meeting uh, in uh, Flagstaff last year was very successful, so we collected more. The rent, however, we, the, you know, the uh, office space on the ground floor, we didn't rent it out for the full year, so that's down a little bit. But here, our general revenues are up, $160,000, that's great. But you're, you've been looking at this going, wait a minute, you know, we, we're, we're down on the investment. Well, as we discussed in March, as Chris reported on from the minutes, we did not draw out of the endowment fund for several months last year because we had adequate cash in the bank. So therefore, we only took out 250 for operations. We had planned to take out $650,000. So therefore, we left 400,000 in the endowment fund. That's actually a positive. So even though it shows a big loss down here, it was an intended, a planned loss, hence that word right there, saying that we deliberately decided we did not need to take all that money out and left it in place. So expenses, we can see that we spent a little bit more in a couple of categories, but really there's this non-cash expense down here called depreciation, which is the biggest difference. And so it's not a use of cash, so we can safely ignore that and come down and say that really we met the budget in most respects and exceeded it in several respects. Now, the other question we always get, so I'm going to put this in there until people stop telling me to do it, and that is what's going on in the, okay, come on, let's advance. There we go. What's going on in some of these restricted funds? And we always have a lot of interest in the AAVSO net. We brought in 550 bucks of donations. We spent 10,000 something dollars on some equipment and stuff like that. So we spent more than we brought in, but we had 22,000, you know, in the fund, in the bank from prior years. So we're still got money in the bank for purposes of that nature. Here's a few of the other little things, the, the matting, the mile funds and the endowment fund. Now, as I mentioned, this is only two weeks old. The ink is not even dry. We haven't even started talking to the auditors. One of the first things I do when talking to the auditors is we take our investment income and start spreading it between these, these funds. This doesn't have that in there yet. The endowment fund will get a few thousand dollars of income allocated to it as will some of the others at lesser levels. So just understand that this is, the error bars are slightly higher than you would like to see, but heck, this is only data two weeks old, so we're good. Okay, we must have a question or two out there. Everybody's paying rapt attention. We have a gentleman in the back. We need the microphone back there. Whoa, we're just waking you up. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, okay, I'll repeat your question. Oh. Uh, for those who didn't hear that, what is the mean rate of return on investment? 
the investment committee headed by Dick, we've been having lots and lots and lots of meetings. We've got new people on the committee. And these are great questions that we've been discussing a lot. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dick, but the mean rate of return was 4.2%. Is that correct? Okay, so we have been discussing with the investment committee what's been going on in the past, what our expenses are, which are about 0.8%, and what we expect to happen in the future. And of course, the future is very tough to predict. A lot of people think that sometime in the near future, we're going to have a recession. And I call that in the next year or two. Our investment advisors think that it's going to be short and shallow were the actual words that they used, but you know, who can predict, it, predict these things? We are trying to protect the portfolio against such a thing. One of the goals that we have, which we haven't quite met, is to have 18 months of cash on hand. Why is that? Because if you're in a recession, you don't want to have to be selling stuff to turn a paper loss into a realized loss. So we're not quite there. We would like to extend that out. We're having discussions with the investment advisors as to what we can do to extend that in the future and what we can do to increase the, re the returns. The, the short answer, okay. Arnie. Great, thank you. Um, you are 260-ish thousand below budget uh, this year. Uh, that you made up with with available cash. Right. What are you going to do next year? Ah, well, I mean, we have a budget, and 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 so far, I'm going to say for the first month, we haven't drawn out per that budget. The one of the big issues was the database of software, which was discussed extensively at the council level, and the council decided that we have to protect that data, and with the agreement of the membership, I do believe they authorize an additional expense to hire the proper people to go in and fix all that. So that was going to be part of an increase. I'm expecting personally that, you know, we may not quite draw out the full budgeted amount, but it's going to be substantial and we are going and, and it's going to, we created a budget that's going at, that's a break even budget, but I'm expecting the investment pool is probably going to go down a little bit next year, particularly if we have a recession. Any other questions? Wow, either I was super clear or you guys haven't had your coffee yet. Oh, one more in the back. It's the asteroid. Um, perhaps Arnie's question was incorporated in your answer. Database management expense. Uh, you see it increasing, and if so, how much? Yeah. And what's the trend going to be okay. in the upcoming years? Is it going to be double every two or three years, or are we tapering off? Well, it, that's a real hard thing to predict. And still, I might be able to answer this better than I can, but we hired a firm, Clear, Clearview, and the contract is for $10,000 a month. And, and we expect the project is three years, is that correct? So now we have a contract and then we are renewing it annually. Okay. So that is partly made up by the fact that we were paying the AAS to maintain some of this stuff for us. So it's not an in total increase of 10000 a month, but it is an increase. And we've had to build that into our budget. And, you know, it's going to be tough. Revenues in the future are going to be real tough. It's hard to get grants. It's hard to do everything these days. We are competing against every not-for-profit in the world for funding. Um, so, but we, you know, through the whole process of strategic planning that Gordon has been talking about, we're bringing in people who know how to fundraise, who can advise on this, and all of that. So, it's basically we're trying to meet all these challenges as best we can. It's working. I'm new here, so excuse the, me if this is a novice question, but uh, what's your spending policy in terms of percentages and do you stay within it and do you expect to uh and are are you is it are is it designed to maintain the endowment in perpetuity well it, as most people know in the audience we've been drawn out more than is thought to be sustainable 
the council for, I don't know, 10 years is before my time, Arnie can maybe answer this question, has been drawn out 5%. Almost every investment advisor in the world is gonna say, that's too much. You know, the conservative approach is 4%. Some people can argue for a little bit more, you know, it might be slightly different for not for profit, but the, the general concept is, 5% is thought to be way too much. And that's why we're trying, we actually set a goal in place, the investment committee and the council authorized it for a ramping down that will get to that point, but it'll be, have to be over a period of time. Um, and that was approved two years ago, Dick, is that correct? Um, okay. And so last year we didn't drive up 5%, depending upon what baseline you care to use, it might've been closer to 4.2 to 4.5. With the additional expenditure for to Clearview to fix these software problems, it's not going to be that low next year. It simply can't. You know, we got two masters to meet here. But the idea is that we definitely want to get down to something sustainable, and we're hoping that, that the CAP people can actually give us some ideas as to how to get there. But that is the big subject in every council meeting and every investment committee meeting at that this is first and foremost on everybody's mind that we want this to last far into the future. Just as a reminder to me, what is 1% of the endowment that is the difference between five and four? How much um, dollars? Wait, wait, wait. 130, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I could do that math in my head. That's pretty strange this time in the morning, okay? The back. A two-part question. Okay. Uh, the first part, it's a little hard to see from back here, but it seemed that the the operating revenues had gone up somewhat this year, if I read it right. They did. And I, I would like to understand that a little better. And the second part is, what's the policy as far as allocation for the investment fund? Is it 70-30? Is uh, what do you, I don't the, know. the allocation of, of the investments to the various funds is based upon a percentage of the whole. I, no, I'm, no, I'm sorry. No, I mean by in asset class for what oh, it's invested okay. in. I did not bring up that slide, but it's, and Dick can probably answer this a little better. Um, it was U.S. equities and some foreign equities and some large cap. It's a fairly traditional um, a mixture compared to what some, we feel we've been talking about that maybe we want to change a few of the allocations to get more into some, you know, dividends and things like that. Um, so I, I don't have that slide up with me. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's, you wouldn't be shocked by the allocations. Um, okay, that was the first part. Oh, oh the revenues, that's right. The, the revenues were up for two reasons. A little bit is dues, growth in members, great. You know, super, we love that. And we got, in the contribution area, we got two bequests. Um, that, you know, you sure can't budget for that sort of stuff, but when it happens, it's very much appreciative. And the annual meeting last year was very successful, and I'm hoping this year will be very successful also. Hi, uh, uh, quick question. How do you guys plan for like major systems upgrades and capital uh, budget, either for, you know, the software infrastructure or equipment? How do you plan for that? Do you build a reserve into the budget? What's the approach? Well, that was planned at the board level. Board, I'm using the bylaw term, assuming that that'll be the, the terminology. The board council level had been discussing that for a couple of years as to what the best approach was and, and what the funds were gonna be and everything. And then, uh, it, you know, when the contract was presented, it was always, of course, a little bit different than what was expected, but with, within range. Um, so, so far we haven't had any other major infrastructure improvement plans like hardware, equipment, computers, stuff like that. Uh, those things are usually fairly small and just, you know, become part of a normal budgetary process. But the big thing had been talked about at committee and, and council level. That was great. We had some great questions. Thank Bob for a very detailed report. And let me just add to that whole discussion on finance, and I, 
you're probably tired of me saying this, but coming out of the strategic planning process, we have got to get these numbers in balance. Okay, we have to have a concrete plan to be sure that the income and the expense match and that, that the plan for expense covers the priority program. So we plan to do that. Stella is actively working uh, with various organizations to increase potential grants and donations. CAP has uh, some specific suggestions to us on how to raise additional money. So this is not a zero sum game. Our goal, our hope is that we can come out of the strategic plan with a better expectation, realistic expectation for increasing uh, funds that come into the organizations and then put together a plan that matches. So that, that's kind of the big picture. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to those who are watching us online. Mary Sue? All right. Uh, so the first item for my report is actually to recognize the individuals who, whom we've lost last year. Uh, and who were very loyal, very close friends of the AVSO and of, non, of citizen astronomy in general. And I would like to start with uh, George Fortier, who was actually a past president. We lost one of our past presidents this past summer. He was a council member and officer between 69 and, and uh, 99. He was an AVSO member for 34 years and he was a visual observer. So he has more than 4,000 visual and PEP observations in our database. Uh, Jerry Sterling was a president of the Astronomical League, one of our sister associations, uh, and he actually played a very important role of encouraging younger individuals to be more involved with the Astronomical League's program. Bob Ghent was a 30th president of the Astronomical League, and he was a president of the International Dust Sky Association, and he was an advocate of more programs, so he expanded the program of the Astronomical League. Dr. John Canizzo, a very good friend of the AVSO, a very cherished colleague, uh, he was a very good friend of Janet Mattis, actually, and they wrote one of the seminal papers on SSC. Uh, he was a researcher at the Astrophysics Science Division at NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, and he was very strongly committed in advancing women in sciences and astronomy in math at a time where the, the field was very male-dominated. Uh, Gerard Dyke, he was an ABSO member for 39 years. He contributed over 160,000 visual variable star observations. So as a person who con has contributed 25 variable star observations in the last three, four years, 160,000 is quite an achievement. Of course, he got the 150,000 variable star observation award. And he also got the 43rd uh, Merit Award in 2012. And actually, I had the, I was fortunate to meet him in person. He used to come to our meetings with our, with quite very frequently. And Dr. Ricardo Giagoni, he was a Nobel laureate. He was a director of Space Telescope Science Institute. And in principle, he's a father of X-ray astronomy. So the first X-ray satellites uh, were inspired from his work uh, in astrophysics. And actually, the first conference of women in astronomy was held at uh, space telescope during his tenure. We also lost Dr. Nancy Grace Roman. She was the first chief of astronomy in the Office of Space Science at NASA headquarters, and she was the first woman to hold an executive position at NASA. Um, she has a minor planet on her honor, and actually she's one of the four women of NASA that is immortalized in the Lego series. So I have one of these uh, in my office, just to remind that, you know, uh, women are actually powerful, although they, they have not been recognized for years and years. And last but not least, I'd like to recognize this individual whom we lost in 2017. He actually left a really substantial bequest to the AVSO this past year. Uh, so that is uh, actually getting him in the Argelander Society. It's as if he, he knew that we would need the money last year in order to fix our infrastructure. So um, we miss him dearly. He's one of the Nova searchers back in the time where all these automated surveys had not even been conceived. He was actually part of the team that was scanning the night sky to identify bright Nova for our observers and uh, researchers to work on. Um, so he has four different uh, discoveries under his belt. So we're really very grateful for his contribution and leaving his legacy with the AVSO. So with that, I would like you to join me in a moment of silence. You don't mind standing up?
Thank you. With that, I would like to start by reminding you that this is a safe space. Uh, this is our webpage for our policies. And as Christine mentioned, um, the one that we're highlighting has to do with our event policy and non-discrimination or harassment policy. Pretty much what that uh, translates to is that the ABSO is a place where everybody is, should be uh, comfortable expressing their opinion in a respectable way, working in astronomy, contributing to astronomy. This is a safe space for all. So this is pretty much what these um, this, uh, uh, policies are saying. So with that, I would like to start by actually pointing out the obvious. Uh, it takes, there you go. It takes um, a lot of people, it takes a lot of work to make this happen. There's lots of things that happen behind the scenes that um, are not obvious, but are really necessary and critical for us to be able to serve you, our community. And these, the individuals who are behind the scenes uh, are actually working quietly, but really hard in order to make this happen. So with that, I would like to, uh, to introduce our staff at headquarters. We have a small group that is, does pretty much everything. And I would like to recognize their work. Bert Pablo, where's Bert? Stand up. I want everybody to stand up. All my staff stand up, please. Uh, Bert Pablo is, is uh, uh, leading the science team. He's in charge of our infrastructure update. When we were working with a new company, bringing uh, new people, just making sure that our, our databases, our software, our IT, anything and everything really works. Uh, and he's, he's actually also trying to do some research on the side, which is interesting. Uh, Elizabeth Wogan, you know Elizabeth, she's been with us for 35, 40 years now, uh, and she is working on alerts, campaigns. Uh, she's the one who, whom you, you're going to talk to. If you pick up the phone, you have a question about your observation. If you have a question about the light curve, she's, she's been working on the meeting as well, uh, and actually on a, a special project this year, digitizing our database, um, databases the existing cards. So imagine the patience of a person that looks through. I'm not even going to. Uh, Sarah Beck, who is a te technical assistant, data quality control. The reason why professional astronomers come to us because they trust the database, they trust our data. They trust that if we have, every data set that comes in our database is being checked. I'm not saying that, and actually we do find discrepant data and that can happen from the most experienced observers, not necessarily for novices, simply because those of you who work with automated equipment know that there's no such thing as a perfect piece of software, there's no such thing as a perfect filter wheel. Things happen, as simple as that. So uh, once we're checking the data, we're giving feedback to observers and actually making sure we understand whether the discrepancy is real or whether we just discovered a new phenomenon in the, the stellar uh, light curve and actually move forward this way. And also Sarah is working on small projects that have to do with our infrastructure, our software, et cetera, et cetera. She's working a lot with volunteers and she's heading that uh, data quality control team. Sebastian Otero, oh my goodness, VSX. And we're very happy to have him here. Um, Sebastian's working on VSX with one other volunteer and a couple of others who just joined the, the team. We're talking about the backbone of the AVSO, a super catalog. I'm gonna mention a couple of things as well. Uh, and he's going to tell us more about his work, but we're talking about a tremendous effort to keep this catalog as uh, updated as possible and as pure as possible in terms of no duplicate er entries, no constant stars in there, being, providing a very vital resource for every researcher on, on the planet. Every time I go to a conference, professional conference that pre present VSX to those who don't know it, their eyes kind of open, as in, you have that, and can I access it? Um, Kathy Spire, oh my goodness, what would we do without uh, operations? Kathy is actually running the place, really. If it wasn't for Kathy, the rest of us would be dying up there. Uh, we're talking about everything you don't see, but it's really vital for a nonprofit um, life, for a nonprofit's life. So we're talking about finances, we're talking about maintenance, we're talking about awards and uh, um, even certificates, membership. Uh, meetings, and I'm pretty sure I forget the most of the things that Kathy's doing. Owen took, Owen joined us about four years ago, and pretty much it's amazing that he's, he's, he has evolved in his position. He started as an admin assistant, but right now he's doing that and everything else. Um, so Owen's actually keeping us up and running, and actually he's running the meeting here. 
with all the technology, making sure that all our computers are working and making sure that um, even we're fed occasionally, you know, sometimes you forget. Lindsay Ward, she joined us quite recently. She joined us as a, an office uh, assistant, but right now she's moving to, um, to communications. You've seen our presence uh, in social media. We have pumped up our press release output. This is actually really important for individuals to appreciate what it is that we're doing. It's exactly what Gordon was saying yesterday. We can't exactly say, hey, we're here. Go find us. We live in a world that, that has so much so much noise that we can't hide in, the, in it. So Lindsay is gonna be helping with all our marketing efforts moving forward. So with that, please, uh, oh, and Mike Saladigo, how can I forget Mike? Mike is, a, the force, is our uh, journal manager. He has retired, we're trying not to have him retire completely. We try not to make a person retire, really. Uh, so Michael is helping with, uh, with the manuscripts, uh, traffic, uh, with all kinds of things that have to do with the journal. Now we have a new editor in chief uh, with a transition between two editors, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, let's thank them. Just a round of applause for these individuals. <laughs> for working 120 hours a, uh, a week and they still talk to me. So <laughs> thank you guys, thank you. With that, uh, we have also an army of volunteers. Um, what would we do without the volunteers? What would we do without you? Uh, and actually, I, I was very ambitious to kind of try to put every single name in a slide. Uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, I have a poster actually with all the names outside. But what I would like to tell you is pretty much how we are inter interacting with the volunteers, what kind of work we're doing with them. So all of you, our observers, who are actually submitting your data to our database, uh, we're sort of twisting your arm a little bit, but you're doing that out of the goodness of your heart and because you're passionate and you love astronomy, you want to contribute to science. Uh, our council, committee, all those individuals who actually are thinking and they're spending, actually they're, they're staying awake at night to actually figure out how we're going to run this organization the best way we can. And not only that, how are we going to be sustainable? How are we going to be this great organization in 50 years from now, in 100 years from now? What, what do our members want? What do, does our com, uh, community want? People who are working on spe special projects with us, um, and special projects can be from software to databases, to even exploring different things. There are lots of trial and error uh, in order to improve our products and improve our, our software that you don't see. Some things work, some things don't. That's how science goes. The VSX team, oh my gosh, Sebastian. It's actually Sebastian, Patrick Wills, um, yes, Klaus and, uh, and Patrick, Patrick, yes. So four people to maintain a database of more than a million objects. I'll leave it there. Uh, obser observing sections, um, we, we witnessed a very, very interesting um, very interesting discussion groups yesterday. It was so refreshing to actually talk about subjects that actually, and objects that, that make us passionate and learn from each other. So we're trying to actually focus more on observing sections, but we need to recognize that the observing section leaders are volunteers. Charts and sequences. Every time we're looking for, uh, for comparison stars, every time we're looking for a sequence, every time we have an alert, we are actually reaching out to those volunteers who are actually working uh, on time to provide the appropriate uh, comparison stars, data validation, the mentoring program. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, we have, in, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but it's fantastic to see people learning from others. So novice is reaching out to more experienced observers. And for me as a novice uh, visual observer a couple of years ago, I had two mentors and Sebastian was one of them. Just trying to understand how to do um, visual observing with my binoculars and without a go-to system. Really hard to find those stars, you know? <laughs> Choice courses, course instructors, these are volunteers. Software development and support. We do a lot at headquarters, excuse me, at headquarters, but we work a lot with volunteers. Uh, ADSONet itself, it's run completely by volunteers. Um, the special archival projects, we still have people who are uh, digitizing data from man old manuscripts so to make sure that that data is in our database, uh, and translators of manuals. And I'm pretty sure I forgot lots of uh, other uh, ways that we're working with uh, individuals, but I would like to recognize all the different ways that we are engaging the community to the ADS, or to the heart of the ADS and what we're doing. 
So for that, uh, this is an, um, an outline of my report. It will have two parts. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some numbers here and some highlights of uh, the year, some projects, the new projects that we're having, meetings. I'm going to have a discussion about the ABS or the era of large surveys, some things that perhaps you want to, to know, we need to discuss. We're going to go to our works, uh, election results, and then we're going to break for coffee. And we're going to go, we are going to continue with our strategic planning part two. So let's get started with this. You saw this yesterday, our membership is increasing, it's exactly what Gordon showed you. Um, so right now we have more than 1,200 members, which is fantastic. I'm going to focus here on our observers, because I find it's very interesting that there are individuals who come from all over the world, primarily from the US, but also Spain, the UK, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Ukraine, and there's a 23% here that represents about 53 different countries. So a quarter of the world, or a little bit more than that, submits data in our database, which I find really cool. Um, how are these observers observing? So we, we're tracking pretty much uh, the mode of observation. In 2019, we have uh, a little bit of decrease of visual observers overall. It seems that DSLR is more or less flat. Uh, CCD is more or less flat. Uh, we, have, we had 105 solar observers. And this is actually amazing because the sun did nothing. And we, <laughs> it's amazing, right? We're talking dedication. And we had uh, pretty much the same number of FEP observers or other. Um, in the other is where you see the decline here. So more or less our observers uh, and the modes they're observing is more or less the same. Uh, again, a reminder that there are individuals who have more than one ways of observing. So this is not a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, representation. Our database is growing. Uh, as of three days ago, we had more than 39 million data points in our database. We're going to cross, I'm pretty sure, 40 million before the end of the month, because this, this number has increased. Uh, and the interesting thing is how our data is being used. The reason why this is a database and not an archive is how data is being actively used by individuals, by researchers all over the world. So we have a 15% from the US, and then Ukraine, Sweden, Japan, India, UK, Chile, Taiwan, Iran, Brazil, and this other, which is almost half, represents 50 countries in the world. So we're talking about researchers from all over the world downloading and using our data for whatever reason. So your science, your work is actually being used here. And not only here, we are also tracking the manuscripts that are being submitted and published in refereed and non-refereed journal through actually NASA's ABS system, right? So this is the official NASA astrophysics data state, uh, database that is actually putting all the refereed and non-refereed uh, manuscripts. This is until the end of September of 2019, so this is not the full year. Everything else is full calendar year. So the blue um, bar is all the, the papers together. The red is the refereed and the gray is the non-refereed. So you see, we see your data in all kinds of manuscripts all over the world, which I think is really cool. Speaking of journals, speaking of manuscripts, this past year we said goodbye to um, John Percy, who finally, after saying uh, for five years that he wants to retire, did retire. We let him retire. So people sort of do retire from the ABSO, I guess. Uh, we had a, we presented him with an award, thanking him for his contribution. And actually, he, um, I would like to highlight this paper, the last editorial that he, um, he put on our uh, journal where he actually talks about seeds and science. And I would like to urge you all to actually take a look at it. It has a lot of wisdom in there. It has a lot of information and a lot of information that is relevant to us. With that, I would like to introduce our new editor-in-chief, uh, Nancy Morrison, Professor Morrison. Do you mind joining me? And I would like to use actually John Percy's words, saying that Morrison's long and suc successful career as a professor, observatory director, and planetarium director suggests that she's another ABSO kinder spirit who will bring new ideas to the ABS and the organization as a whole. So, seal of approval, Nancy, welcome to the ABSO. Uh, would you like to say a couple of words? 
So uh, can I give you a hand? Here. So. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, I've been an uh, AVSO member uh, for a long time. Um, uh, as an observatory director, I was using AAVSO alerts to tell me when something was interesting and happening. So I thought using those, I should be a member and have been a member ever since. First, I want to introduce the journal, even though it uh, really uh, may need no introduction to this audience. But I'm a believer in defining my terms when I start. So uh, here we go. Uh, uh, I want to emphasize that the journal is uh, for um, uh, AAVSO members uh, free to uh, publish and uh, is uh, almost unique in that uh, respect in being both free and very largely open uh, to, the, to the community. We have a wide range of content, uh, not only variable star research results of various kinds, photometry and spectroscopy, and uh, data mining as well. Solar astronomy, uh, after all, the sun is a star, and it does vary. Uh, we uh, offer uh, statistical analysis and modeling. As occasionally you see in a seemingly impenetrable paper full of mathematics, but believe me, it's good stuff. Observing techniques, software, and instrumentation. What's new at your observatory that you would like the public to know about? Education and public outreach relevant to variable stars, and history relevant to variable stars. And finally, just hidden at the bottom of the screen, the occasional review article. So if you uh, feel that your uh, activities are relevant to any of those and you would like to uh, please consider submitting an article. And if you need more information about that process, feel free to talk to me. What would I like to do? The journal is great, but there's nothing on this planet that can't be improved. And I'd like to uh, venture into that territory. I certainly would like to have more authors, and I've just spoken to you in that regard, both amateur and professional. And I'd like to broaden the pool of referees, to broaden the uh, demographics uh, of, of our authors, uh, more students, more young people, uh, both amateurs and professionals. I'd like to look for innov innovative ways to make the data that have been published in the AAVSO journal uh, accessible to the public, uh, either by download or by other means. I'd like to make the journal more interactive so that uh, possibly you could uh, click on a graph and uh, see the data, uh, maybe, able to, maybe able to zoom in on the data. Uh, those are all possibilities that are being explored by other journals. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I need to work with the staff and see what's feasible given uh, our resources. And we've just heard about the limitations on our resources. I want to commit to a collegial, fair, educational experience for both author and referee. Uh, there is an ethics statement for authors on the journal webpage, uh, so that as an author you have um, uh, standards, uh, both uh, professional in terms of data content, in terms of editorial content, and also personal to uphold. Uh, another set of standards of similar quality should be applied to referees, and I will be, uh, most journals have such as a code of contact, and I will conduct, and I will be uh, working to develop one for us. Um, some, something does go on behind the scenes, I understand, which is that if a referee does make, um, a, uh, shall we say, um, overly personal or not terribly professional comments to an author, that those are edited out before the author sees them. But the referees should be informed of that as well. Basically, the code of contact would, conduct would consist of, consist of no author bashing, please. And finally, I'd like to get more uh, review articles because I think those have major um, educational value. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll take questions later, I think, about this. Thank you, thank you. Um, wonderful. And with that, I would like to share with you a uh, council decision. Um, I've, you know, I've been going to conferences very frequently to talk to our professional community. And one of the things they're saying is that, well, but I can't reach your, your manuscript right away. There is a proprietary period of, of, uh, of a year before I reach to it. And you know, my answer is why aren't you a member? Stuff like that. But at the same time, we do understand that we do need to make your research or the published research immediately 
uh, available. In the world of open access, we are opening the journal. So uh, as of uh, the next issue, because we're closing this pretty much in December, the manuscripts that are being published on the webpage, of the journal webpage, will be available to everybody all over the world right away. So um, I'm hoping that this is going, or we're hoping that this is going to increase the uh, visibility of the journal, increase the, uh, the, um, the citations of the journal uh, manuscripts, and also attract more authors because well, pretty much their science will be available there to, to share with their colleagues. So we're doing that. So here's what I'm not going to talk about today. I'm not going to tell you all the work that we've been doing with cybersecurity. This is something that we completed in February. We learned a lot about our infrastructure and some little holes or backdoors that we hadn't realized exist there. Uh, we also onboarded a new IT company. Um, lots of work there to make sure that they understand what we have as an infrastructure. And again, we're talking about a really complicated set of databases, of programs, of uh, how they talk to each other and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, we are at the point of completing this Drupal 7 to 8, at least the back end of it, uh, migration. Um, but it's been a fantastic uh, collaboration. Bert has been leading, actually, this effort from headquarters side uh, with a team of volunteers. Um, digitizing a membership directory, we're hoping to retire paper and put it in an archive to protect it, if not anything else. There's lots of really valuable data there, but it's not in our database. Uh, observing sections, working to revitalize it, um, identifying more individuals who will be involved in the leadership team, get a little bit of more updates on the web pages, et cetera, et cetera. Data quality control, observer feedback, this is ongoing. It's happening all the time. And this is something we're not compromising on. Alerts campaigns, oh my goodness, uh, targets of uh, interest to the professional and non-professional community, to anyone for that matter, who really need data. And they come to us to ask you, actually, uh, for, for more data for their projects. Uh, the journal, content enhancements, new editor-in-chief onboarding. We've had many very interesting discussions, both with John and with Nancy, uh, in order to see how we're going to move forward the journal as a, a, a stronger avenue of commun communicating science amongst, uh, amongst our members, observers, community in principle. Um, meetings. I'm hoping that you're all having fun, but it takes a village. So it's a lot of effort to make sure that this, uh, we, we are offering you the best services at the meetings and they are pleasure, they're, they're a place where you're, gonna, you're having fun while you're getting together. Put together the, the schedule, put together the hotels and all kinds of things that uh, happen behind the scenes. Membership services, finance, administration, communication, building maintenance, anything and everything that is actually necessary, it's vital for us to exist. Uh, but this is something that we don't get to appreciate very frequently, and that's why I'm actually mentioning it here. Um, what I, I am going to talk about, oh, and actually the strategic planning. We've been really working very hard this past year behind the scenes to understand our membership, all the things that Gordon mentioned today, uh, and from there to figure out how we're going to move forward in a strong, sustainable way, and how we're going to make the AVSO more relevant and necessary for the community we're serving. So I would like to start by pointing out VSX reached another milestone. Right now we have more than 1 million objects cataloged in that uh, database. When I started at the AVSO five years ago, it was 300,000, I think. So we're talking about uh, more than four times more objects. And actually most of them were imported last year. These are some of the catalogs that were uh, imported by Sebastian and his team uh, from WISE new catalogs to uh, Coro data to K2 stars, uh, new variables from Assassin, Ogle, we're working very close with the Ogle team. Uh, and, you know, I, this is not even comprehensive. This is just an example of how our database is growing. And of course, those data need to be checked before imported. It's not that we just take it and we just put it in there. Check for duplicates, check, check for quality. Um, most of these data come out of automated uh, pipelines, make sure that they're correct, et cetera, et cetera. We're also growing a mentor program. So Chris mentioned that we had 22 mentors. Um, and actually right now we have 39 individuals from, uh, let's see, from 14 different countries seeing mentors. And I would like to urge you um, to actually join our mentoring programs, extremely valuable. We get requests almost every month 
or actually almost every week, every time we talk to Sebastian, he, he tells us about uh, new mentor requests that come in. Individuals really appreciate learning from other observers, from observers. So please uh, consider joining this program. Also, we offer a, a suite of really amazing uh, choice courses. One of the new ones actually this year has been uh, a solar choice course. Yes, the big complaint was that the sun was not doing anything. There was nothing I could do about that. Uh, but actually, we have uh, um, enlisted a couple of other volunteers to, to teach the exopliant observing course um, to actually help Dennis with that. Uh, and of course, we offered the CCD photometry part one and two, variable star classification in light curves, uh, how to use V-star uh, photometry using v v -fot, and the one that is coming up is, um, is actually another exoplanet uh, in November. Every time we build anything at the AVSO or improve anything, we try to track it. We try to see how it's, pro it's progressing, what its progress is, what its usage is. It's not that we're releasing a tool, we're releasing a set of software and we just let it go. We're trying to see whether it really serves the community, it really serves its intended goal. So we are tracking the membership tool that we have, we're tracking the target tool, we also track the Likert generator. We produced a, a new tool not too long ago, and it seems that in the, it, it's doing extremely well. And the interesting thing is that the trend, these two trends seem to be very similar. People who are still using LCG1 and people who are still using LCG2, um, to the point where I dare say there, there's a lot of overlap of those individuals who are trying both ways. Um, here is an announcement for you. We are officially now launching a spectroscopy database. And I understand this is something that our community was craving and wanted for a long, long time. This is something that we introduced uh, last February here at the Hotel Encanto in a small spectroscopy workshop. So now officially it's available for everyone. And the main idea for AG Spec is to actually provide spectra alongside light curves. This is DRR Lyra. This is the prototype of uh, pulsators of the whole category. And these are some spectra that were acquired by Christian Buell. And actually you can see even differences in, uh, so this is the, the little line here is the rest wavelength. And you can see lines going back and forth as the star pulsates. So there are the many, many different uh, Likert behaviors that can be uh, identified alongside spectra and the other way around. And this is actually maximizing not only the contribution of our observers in, in science, but also the science itself that comes out. So uh, if you have a spectrograph, you want to play with spectra, we have now a database for you. And not only that, we have the observing section has manuals for anything you do or you don't want to know about spectroscopy. We have targets, suggested targets for individuals to observe with all types of resolutions, all types of uh, spectrographs, both from the North and the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we have all kinds of observer resources. There are some really cool uh, videos there of how to use different tools or different pieces of software. And of course, we do have a database. And actually, when it comes to the database, it can be accessed from here. Um, while we're testing it, uh, right now it has more than 550 sector in it of all types of objects, uh, from about 20 observers from all over the world. And the emphasis here is quality. Every single spectrum that comes in this database is being checked for quality. We're talking about the wavelength scale, we're talking about signal to noise, we're talking about even the type of star, we're talking about the instrumental correction, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to actually produce, uh, have a database of high quality for science, as simple as that. Um, so with that, we also started an ambassador program last year. And this is pretty much a program that's targeting younger individuals. By younger, I mean younger than me. And no, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am. So uh, we uh, assembled a group of really very talented uh, young minds who are already leaders in their groups, in their fields. Uh, and it's actually a great pleasure to introduce them to you here. Molly Watkining is an astrophotographer. She just started graduate school at Berkeley right now. Uh, Melanie Croson, Melanie, stand up, please, please. So you, you saw Melanie yesterday uh, and you will see her again today, yes? Uh, she's gonna give her talk today. Uh, she's working on RLI and she's one of the new, uh, the new leaders of our, of our RLI um, 
short period pulsator session. Uh, Alexander Bells is Sweeney. Is Alex here? Alexander, Alexander. He's the bat now. <laughs> All right, so Alexander is a solar astronomer. I had the opportunity, the good luck to meet him through uh, Father Grady Boyce's program. Uh, he took the uh, planet observing course. He just finished a, a very cool REU program at uh, the National S uh, Solar Observatory. Uh, so he can tell you all about the sun. And Anna Veronica Parra. Anna, I met our Anna as well through uh, Pat and Grady. And actually, she is a she is a biologist and an aspiring graduate student astronomer. So she's taking physics courses in order to go to graduate school. And she's very interested in exoplanets. She has uh, exoplanets, um, astrobiology. What um, what makes a planet habitable, things like that. So uh, she's very into outreach. So with that, uh, I would like to actually uh, invite you all, if you know individuals who are interested in all kinds of activities, outreach activities, research activities, but they would like to actually join our ambassador program, please encourage them to do so. It's not just observing variable stars. Not everybody can do it, especially if you don't have the means, if you live in a big city but you can actually contribute by uh, communicating data or the value of variable stars. You can contribute by writing a blog. Now everybody's online. You can contribute by being on social media and, and uh, communicating the value of observations from small telescopes. You can contribute by taking your own data, of course, but analyzing data as well as your project, as a, as a poster, giving talks to your own local astronomy club. So please encourage them to come and join us. Uh, just an email, abso.abso.org, and we will actually communicate with, uh, with whomever is interested and, and figure out what kind of activities they're in and actually disseminate their work to the community. For young individuals, this looks very good on their resume. I leave it there. So we also had a, an uh, annual campaign around this particular pro uh, theme, exactly because we wanted to encourage more younger individuals to come to the AVSO, cultivate and grow the future of the AVSO. This was the theme for this particular campaign. So we wanted uh, to um, collect money in order to curate our databases, to maintain the software that we have, uh, maintain alerts campaigns. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, um, individuals to do that. Uh, educational resources, the journal, meetings, workshops. This was our campaign about this year. Uh, we were very, very fortunate to have matching funds from two individuals, two donors, who actually pledged to double the amount of money that anyone gives up to the $50,000 level. So uh, we managed to get uh, about $37,000, but those two individuals just gave us $50,000 dollars regardless. So the total amount that we gathered was 87K. A little bit less than our target, but we're really very grateful by the community's generosity. And by the way, we realized one thing. Um, we didn't have any monthly giving program up to that point. Uh, so if, and there are individuals who feel much more comfortable giving a little bit every month instead of just one sum at the very end. That, that helps with budgeting. So if you're interested, please join our monthly giving program. But $10, $10 a month would actually help uh, the big picture at the AVSO. Um, also, my staff has a challenge for membership. Last year, um, the, the challenge was to actually renew our membership by 100% by the end of January. We reached about 90% of our uh, goal last year, 2019. So we had 90% of our membership renewals by the end of 2018. So the question is, can we do the same thing this year? And actually, can we go 100% this year? So please remember to renew your membership. You can do it online, you can do it by talking to individuals, you can do it on the phone. There are many, many different ways. Um, Let's see, with that, uh, I'm gonna go to, oh, actually, yes, a reminder. AVSO membership, it's a great holiday gift. Holidays are coming. Do you want to encourage your friends, family, nieces, nephews, and their kids to, um, to get started in astronomy? Just give them a membership. I think that it's, it's a really cool thing. Actually, I'm gonna give a membership to my older, um, my older nephew. AVSO membership. He's nine. Can he become a member at nine? 
okay, maybe I will stumble upon, maybe if I add all their ages, it would be at over 18. So, um, but this is actually a really good idea for those who are passionate about astronomy, but they don't know the, about the AVSO, and they want to belong to a group that is also passionate about astronomy. Um, moving on to our meetings, uh, as Gordon said, we are in uh, communication right now with another organization for a spring meeting so we're not going to make an announcement yet about that but please um, mark your calendars for 2020 November 2020 this is going to happen uh, in Somerville Massachusetts on the orange line so metro line Massachusetts um, and it actually it's going to start with a spectroscopy workshop so the spectroscopy workshop of November 4 and 5, the annual meeting November 6 to 7. So mark your calendars for that. With that, I would like to transition to something different. Um, there is a very active discussion it's happening anywhere and everywhere I go and I meet our observers. Are we still relevant in the air of large surveys? Are they running us out of business? And we had this discussion before here. And actually yesterday, most of the talks that you heard from uh, professional astronomers, those who are really getting paid to do astronomy, is something like, we really need you. We really do. But let's take a look at surveys. So traditionally, when you were an observer, actually when I was an observer, uh, a graduate student observer, you just take your, um, your observing program, you go to the telescope and take your data, you analyze your data and you get your results, right? Now with those surveys, things have become a little bit more complicated. So you have a survey that gets a whole bunch of stuff. You have a survey telescope that gets a whole bunch of stuff. And then you put it in a database. And the researcher goes to that database and looks to see whether there is something interesting in there for them. And either they use the database outcome to, to publish a manuscript, Usually a statistical manuscript. We found 5,000 RLIRA, 3,000 of, of them show blah phenomena. Or they are looking for a, a telescope or some kind of resource to take additional data in order to understand what on earth they're, they're looking at. And then they publish the results. Most of our colleagues are doing this because the, the objects that we are studying are so dynamic, they're so variable that you just can't live just with the survey data. And actually, even those surveys are not exactly solving everybody's problems. Kepler K2, oh my goodness, everybody loved Kepler when it came out. It was staring at the same part of the sky for four years, nonstop. How can you do anything better? Well, the cadence was uh, 30 minutes. So data acquisition for those stars had a, you open the shutter for 30 minutes and collect photons. So if something has a periodicity less than that, you've missed it. There's just a selected number of targets that had a one minute cadence. It's like literally hand-picked. Not only that, this particular, uh, this particular spacecraft did not download full frame images. It was actually observing specific stars and it would collect only that little part of the CCD that had those stars. So it collected what they called stumps. So it's not everything. So if something happens in the background, if an interesting object explodes, for example, or a star that they don't consider important does something different, you will miss it. And then Kepler is dead. So lots of really interesting stuff that came out of the Kepler, um, the Kepler mission and need follow-up cannot be followed up by Kepler itself. Well, how about another mission called BRIGHT? BRIGHT is actually an amazing mission to study really bright stars. We're talking about stars brighter than six magnitudes. Um, and actually, Bert is working in the, in the BRIGHT team, so you can see some fantastic lectures out of that. Here's the deal. It's one star per satellite. So you turn your satellite to one star, and you take data on this one object. Okay, every time. So you stay there for a month, and then you go to another star, and then you go to another star. It's not exactly the most efficient observing, observing um, strategy, right? Plus, because they're looking at one star, calibration or comparisons are really difficult. You're just uh, reducing that data standalone. That's all you're doing. 
Uh, let's go to TESS. And TESS is, uh, is uh, you know, one thing that professional astronomers were looking for a long, long time. Because actually TESS, uh, this is a transiting exoplanet uh, survey, is going to look for the brightest stars around us and actually see whether there are exoplanets around them. And TESS is downloading full frame images. The data are open access to everybody. Everyone can actually go and reduce them and study their favorite object. Uh, it's actually in the, the V band, which is fantastic. Its target, of course, is exoplanets, but the whole universe is changing, right? As we know, the most interesting objects are not necessarily exoplanets. Here's the interesting thing. It has 23 arc second size pixels. So source confusion is a serious problem with TESS. When you, you, put, you have one pixel, 23 arc seconds, and you put a, a three pixel aperture around to do, do your photometry, you're up to a minute around your target and you're extracting that light. So it's not exactly, again, source confusion. It's not exactly that one star that you're observing. And actually, the observing strategy of TESS is actually to look at each part of the sky for a month. So great, we have continuous observations for a month. What happens then? So if you find something interesting in the test data, you definitely need to follow up from the ground. And the nice thing, actually, with this kind of satellite is that it can point to very interesting targets for us because we can definitely observe between 8 and 13. Another thing we test is that it's a two-year mission. It's not going to be there forever. It has the possibility to be there forever, but it depends on funding. So the extended mission has been approved. We don't really know how we're going to be observing. But again, just keep that in mind. Some parts of the sky will have only one month of test data, and that's that. How about the ground? So these are space missions. Kelt. We've, uh, from time to time, we have individuals who talk about KELT here. And actually, TESS is very complementary to, uh, KELT is very complementary to, to TESS. They're looking for exoplanets all over the, the night sky. They have two sites now. But at the same time, exactly because they have two sites, they are subject to weather, they're subject to technical problems, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, they're a twin of TESS. They have 23 arc second size pixels. They're huge. So at some point, they do, they do have a group of individuals with smaller telescopes to follow up interesting targets. So that, if not anything else, creates more work for us, right? PTF, ZTF. This is the Palomar Transient Factory and the Zwicky Transient Factory that is using the Palomar Schmidt Telescope in order to actually scan the entire sky, um, at least the entire visible sky. How many of you have, have been at Palomar? How many of you know the biggest problem that we have at Palomar? Which is light pollution <laughs> and weather. It's not the best site. Um, they do, they're only in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, they do have a public portion of the survey and a private portion of the surveys. It's a little bit complicated in which parts of the sky are being released. In other words, you're getting into kind of astropolitics there or what kind of stars you're, uh, they're available for us. They're interested in transients. They're interested in things that go kaboom. Um, let's see, what else we have here? LSST, ooh, how many of you have heard about LSST? How many of you think that LSST is a big competitor for the AVSO? <laughs> Good, so I've convinced you without even having said anything. LSST saturates the bright saturation level at 16. It goes deep, which is fantastic. It saturates at 16. So anything that is interesting and brighter than 16 is a big bright blob on the CCD. Go extract a light curve. At the same time, it's one site, one telescope. It's in the Southern Hemisphere. And even like that, the observing strategy is such that I'm not really sure how, how to say it's not useful. It's really not. So pretty much what they're going to be doing is scanning the entire sky with one filter every, uh, for three days, three, four days in a row, then switch filter and scan the entire sky with a second filter for four days, and then switch filter and scan the entire sky, blah, blah, blah. So they're doing that for five filters. What that means is that if you want a light curve of one star, in one filter, you'll get one point every 20 days. 
Oops. Is that a light curve? So I think that LSST will be fantastic for what it's doing, what it's planning to do, what its mission is, but not necessarily for variable stars. So if we are to recap all the challenges that we have, or the caveats with the big missions, they're, they're very limited in duration, very limited in cadence. Once the satellite's dead, it's dead. Once the mission does not have more money, it's gone. Uh, they, most of them are just one filter. Kepler is one filter, TESS is one filter, uh, Bright is one filter, KELT is one filter, maybe they have a second one. So when you're looking for colors, when you're looking for things that uh, you, you want to extract more information from, then you're stuck. You need ground-based uh, observation. Actually, there's no follow-up of interesting targets. It's not from that mission, if not anything else, because, or, or that survey because they simply have one specific goal, to keep scanning the sky. So if you find something really interesting and you want more data on that, you're not gonna take it from the, you're not gonna get them from the surveys. It's really interesting that they're mostly using automated data reduction pipelines. And Sebastian's gonna tell you more about the challenges of whatever is coming out of this automated data pipeline. But actually, quite recently, I went to Assassin and I was looking for a completely different star, and this popped up. So this is actually a KELT target that is in the Assassin uh, database. Assassin is a fantastic uh, OSCI survey as well. So what you see here is a light curve, it's magnitude versus time, right? Several years of data. And the target that they're extracting is this, where the little cross is. Can you see a star there? Trust me, even if you zoom in, you cannot see a star. There is no star there. This is what the automated pipeline, by putting a, a huge aperture, is actually uh, detecting. So when you, do things, uh, when you do things manually, you can check and see what you're doing there. But when you're trusting a computer 100%, most of the results that you get are not exactly reliable. Uh, from there on, Large, large pixel sizes, Assassin actually has eight arc second uh, pixels. So if, again, if you use a three, um, three pixel aperture, we're talking about a huge aperture. It can encompass other stars. Kelton tests are hopeless and they know it. And that's why they are, uh, they are including ground-based small telescopes in their, in their uh, working groups. And Dennis can tell you, actually Dennis told us more yesterday. There's lots of source confusion going on. Um, one telescope, one site, so for those who have their own observatories, weather, instrument problems, you name it, it can actually happen, it does happen of course. And then not all sky uh, coverage, how do you do your calibrations, moonlight is a problem, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, those databases and web pages for those missions and surveys, et cetera, are being curated only for as long as they have money. Once the team moves on to something else, or uh, once the funding runs out, that's it. So if there's, there are problems there, even if the infrastructure is not up to date, that's no one's problem, principle. That's where they are. So the bottom line is that professional astronomers need your help. Not only uh, surveys, missions, et cetera, are, are not a threat, but you'd better shape up because there's a lot of work to be done here. As simple as that. So this is pretty much what the AAPSO is providing for the professional community and for the community for that matter. We are a collaboration of individuals. We need to, everybody needs to understand that there's no one who is better than anybody else in this collaboration. Professional and non-professional astronomers are some people who are very likely to be paid to do astronomy and some people who are not getting paid to do astronomy. We're all trying to understand some of the, of the most fantastic and fascinating uh, parts of the universe. We are part of the same collaboration. As simple as that. That's how I see the AVSO. Um, we're, we are curating and maintaining all kinds of databases as AVSO. We're providing tools. We want you to actually participate in analysis. Um, we are building a community of science-savvy individuals here. We're trying to, to include as many individuals in this uh, collaboration, in this discussion, simply because we learn from each other. That's how we're going to get better at what we're doing. And of course, a journal. It actually disseminates information. I was actually planning to end with a cartoon, one of my favorite ones that I saw not too long ago. 
You know, we're all wired up in our devices. If I ever lose my, my iPhone, my cell phone, I'm going to sit on the ground and wait for someone to come save me because that's what's happening. And I saw this cartoon that kind of resonated. Uh, it's a discussion, right? It says, what are you doing? I'm using my device. What is your device? My device is the sky. Does your device have many applications? Yes, it has sun, moon, clouds, and birds. And do you have to recharge your device very often? I don't ever have to recharge my device. It recharges me. So I think that this resonates for most of us uh, who are actually looking at the night sky. And yeah, we see pretty stars, but we also see phenomena that other people don't. And this is what we're trying to understand. At the same time, this morning, my friend Bill Stein came and he said, did you see the latest, um, the latest uh, sky and telescope issue? This is December, sky and telescope. I was like, no, what happened? He said, oh, there's this cool article that shows a long-term liker of the AVSO. And AVSO is the first thing they're saying. So I'm going to read just the first paragraph here. Uh, it says, the American Association of Variable Star Observers has been monitoring the star T Ursa Minoris since its brightness variations were discovered in 1912. Now astronomers are using this century of observations to understand the star's recent change in behavior. Cutting edge science right there. This is who we are. So when you're submitting a data point in our database, you never know how it's gonna be used and you never know when it's gonna be used. Maybe someone will pick it up tomorrow and they're gonna do a, a really cool paper within the next three months. Maybe someone needs your data point in 50 years from now. At the same time, if they don't, if that data point does not exist in the database now, they will not find it then. So thank you again for all your contribution. Thank you for being the heart of the AVSO. And this is where I'm gonna stop and ask you if you have any questions for me. Thank you. Uh, remember your graph exactly, but there were two years where there was a dra dramatic drop in membership. One of them was 2005. It's kind of curious what, what cause that drop and also uh, why is it that I, I know I asked this question uh, before at one of the meetings uh, why is it that you have Ukraine being involved but not Russia <laughs> I don't understand there is a big community of individuals that I know of, of individuals in Ukraine who work on cataclysmic variables and they look, uh, work on long-term light curves and actually, I was at a conference recently where some individuals presented their work on outbursts using AVSO data. So this is a, co a very active community that is actually downloading data from our database to use because it, most of the time they don't have access to any other resources. That's, that's, their, that's their telescope. You guys are their collaboration. Um, I don't know about Russia. I think Russia is in the miscellaneous. So what I'm presenting here is the top 10 countries, and then there's the other category. Does this make sense? We do have good colleagues in Russia, actually, good friends. Uh, the general catalog of variable stars is there. There are lots of people who work on CVs. They have their own telescopes at different parts, so they're taking their own data. Um, and they don't necessarily submit them in our database. Does this answer your question? I, I do not know about the drop in membership. Actually, um, Elizabeth, please. The big drop in 2005 was due to the fact that we um, revised how we were counting who was an active member. Prior to then, we had been keeping people on the books as a member who had not paid dues for up to three years. We had a very generous, we'll carry you, you know, and, and many people would eventually pay their two or three years back dues because they didn't want to lose continuity in their membership. And in 2005, we changed that policy and we went through and we took everybody out who actually had not paid in the current year or didn't catch up that year. And that was why that was such a big drop. But it's very, I think it's very exciting to see that how the number rebounded uh, since then, um, that it's back up higher than it was in 2005. And, um, you know, when we, as it were, culled the people who hadn't been, re been renewing. So that's the big, the big difference. And if there's another smaller drop, um, it may have been that there was, there was a, a couple of years when we were doing hands-on astrophysics teacher workshops and the TOPS Towards Other Planetary Systems program that Karen Meach and Janet Maddy, that Karen Meach was running, 
in Hawaii, and Janet Maddy was a participant in, we offered all of those teachers and participants one-year memberships. And so th that was a cluster in, those, um, in the late 90s, around 2000. And those memberships were, you know, they didn't, most of the teachers didn't renew. So those, that's my explanation for that. And then 2007, thank you, Elizabeth. And then 2007, 2008, the big crash uh, in the stock market and the general recession fear. It, it's, it's, you know, people kind of were very afraid to give to nonprofits. So I, I understand this, but uh, now we got an insider's point for 2005. You answer your question? More questions for me. Well, if there are no more questions, mm, there is more questions. In looking at that diagram that's up right now, uh, are most of the members, do they become long-term members? Or is there hidden in those numbers a large number that join for a year and then disappear after a year? There is a number of individuals that join for a year and then disappear afterwards. And we suspect that these are mostly student memberships and some teachers. Um, mentioned yesterday there is a big number of members that we have who become members and continue the membership uh, pretty much for the rest of their life they're, they're long-term members so we're paying attention to this trend and we're also paying attention to the individuals uh, and we're trying to reach out to them when they discontinue the membership to understand what the reason is um, a couple of individuals pass away some others moved to a different um, to a different uh, kind of a different country, a different family situation, um, personal reasons that do not allow them to renew. Uh, it's actually very encouraging to see the trend going up. It really is. So we'll try to continue that. Clarify what I said about the 2005 dues drop. I apologize for that. Part of it was removing uh, m members who were not members. But the big the big cause of that big drop is that that's the year we chant we. That is, that's the, I'm sorry, I'm pausing because I'm just making sure I'm right. That's the year that we transitioned in how we recorded dues payments. And um, that year we switched from recording information on index cards to recording dues payments directly electronically. And there are many, many people who were members in 2005 whose dues payment for that year never got recorded. And so what we are going to do as part of this membership uh, database project that Stella was mentioning that I'm working on is when I have, when I feel that I'm at a point that I have a, a complete history of everybody who was a member in 2004 and was a member in 2006, that same, you know, if they, if they had a membership in 2004 and 2006, they're going to get credit for 2005. So that number will go back up to around 800 when we, when I finish the project that I'm working on. I, I guess I apologize up front. It's a relatively pointed question, but mm -hmm. it's your philosophy of, of AEVSO. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all acknowledge that uh, as the membership ages, it, it mm -hmm. may be reduced in numbers. Uh, and, and I do appreciate your approach to staffing and outreach to entice newer, younger people. Uh, I, I, as, as you know, I wrote a letter to the council members of Two meeting, uh, and I personally enjoyed two meetings a year. Mm -hmm. And I just am interested in your philosophy about balancing budget meetings, getting new members. If you understand what I'm asking, I'm trying to find um, balancing meetings. I think that they're interconnected. So um, I would love to see two meetings a year as well. It's not my decision necessarily. We need to see, to kind of see that in the in the big picture. Uh, new members need to come to our meetings. I'm hoping that the new members who are in this meeting are benefiting from the interactions and from uh, building new friendships, collaborations, etc. Um, I'm trying to understand what your question is. I obviously have a vested interest or a yes. strong interest in, in meetings. And I, and I understand there may be budget issues, maybe I'm wrong, right. about how to, how to support and, mm -hmm. and it takes time and effort to arrange meetings. Uh, and I just wonder if there's, if there's a discrepancy there between trying to get these newer members and trying to make 
existing older members happy in terms of having those. I guess my concern about having one meeting, frankly, mm -hmm. is that I don't think that necessarily means more people will come to that one meeting. Mm -hmm. I think it's more likely that when you have meetings that are close to home, mm -hmm. people then feel it, you know, they have the money certainly to, because it's a smaller expense to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just, I'm trying to wrestle with that balance your budget because it costs more money to do that versus trying to get younger members, but still making older members like myself mm -hmm. uh, happy because I meet my good friends here twice a year. Right. And for me, I'm, I'm meeting my friends here twice a year. So this is really cool. Uh, so um, as you heard yesterday, there's a motion from council to in principle hold two meetings a year uh, with exploring the possibility of having a joint meeting. We've had challenges with previous joint meetings, including the fact that our members don't come. So at some point, you know, if we are to host two, two meetings a year, it's fantastic that I'm meeting with my friends on council. Fantastic that I'm seeing three or four of my friends, but how many, how many individuals do really want that and appreciate and come? So as part of our strategic planning, at some point, we really need to, to find a balance uh, between building relationships, in-person relationships upon, amongst our members all over the world and our budget. So this is a challenge that we're still struggling with, but that's why, again, we're having all these discussions. And that is why we're trying to understand what our resources in are, what our priorities are, what our future steps need to be, and how sustainable the plan that we're making is. For me, sustainability is important. You can't exactly do something for two or three years and then that it collapsed. So I know that this is a non-answer answer, um, and I owe that. Um, we're not ignoring the, your requests or anyone's requests for two meetings a year, and I understand that at some point we need to strategize on where we're gonna hold them if we want people to come. It's nice. Can we bring the coffee here? Uh, hello. I, I know that you like to have meetings that are at locations that also have interesting astronomical things. Yes. However, uh, Blagstaff and Ball State and Las Cruces mm -hmm. are examples of destinations that are somewhat difficult to get to and require an extra travel day to get there. Mm -hmm. So in the hierarchy of things to consider when you're choosing a meeting spot, mm -hmm. Uh, it would be nice to have an easy airplane access and, uh, uh, and perhaps some of us could get there more readily. Yes, you're right. Thank you. And the issue of two meetings a year was brought up in the context of cost. What is the uh, net cost to you after you, you know, uh, take into account the meeting payments that the individuals make? What's the... Uh, part that has to come out of the AABSO budget per meeting, roughly. I don't have the numbers right now, and I won't have the numbers for this meeting until we get back. Uh, and we well, see what well, catering... It's not, it's not just this meeting. I mean, you guys have been looking so for at a previous, budget, so you mm -hmm. must have a generic budget cost for, per meeting. We do have a, a budget per meeting. As uh, Bob just showed you, we had a budget for about 10K last year. Um, it, uh, we, we brought in 30 or something like that, but that does not so count. So 10, 10K was for the two meetings then? Yes. It wasn't really feasible for and it, in costs, my eyes. It, it costs way more. It, that, that particular budget line does not include staff time. What? Does not include staff time. Yes. People who are actually working right. on the meeting. Yeah. So if, if we want to be consistent, if we want to be fair. And the total cost, yeah. You add up the total cost. But again, meetings need to be part of our discussion um, as AVS or our strategic planning. They are part of our strategic planning. So what is the, the uh, purpose of them? What is the value to you? How are we going to modify them in order to increase that value? So if not anything else, when we're sending you a... Uh, an evaluation, a media evaluation at the very end of each meeting. Please write down what you like, what you didn't like. We are, we're getting guidance from you in order to improve our meetings and even to have one versus two meetings. Again, the, the one in Toronto was a little bit alarming. We didn't have the, the turnaround that we were hoping to have. 
So at some point, we're reaching out to you, our community, in order to, to give us guidance for that. I mean, let me like, try to respond first. I'm going to have a response. I'm going to push back a little. Look, I don't know where this rumor story got. We're going to kill the meeting. Okay, and I'm sorry if people out there in the background saying, well, blankety blank blank, these people are killing the meeting. Yes, we've discussed it, okay? There has to be some logic as we put this together. There is a tremendous amount of staff time that goes into these meetings, okay? They are also very valuable to the members when everybody, when people show up. Now we've got a balance to the discussion earlier, the money and the priorities. And that's our plan, okay? So it's very important that you all are saying what you're saying. We heard you. We think that to balance the money issue, we need to team up with another organization so that their staff can carry a lot of the resource and effort to schedule the second meeting Nobody's trying to work against you. I, I, I don't, some times, as we've gone through the strategic planning process, I get this sensation people think the strategic planners, us, me, are working against you. I do not understand that emotion. I really don't. We are really trying to take this organization forward. We are really trying to understand where we are headed over the next 10, 20, years and hopefully another hundred years and beyond that. So this meeting issue, we understand it. We understand the importance of it to many of our members. We also understand there are 1,100 members who aren't here. We're trying to understand how to balance all this. So if we could take the temperature down a little bit and realize this is an objective discussion, it's not Stella's decision, it's not my decision, it is the council's decision, and it's good people have raised it. I'm very glad the issue got raised, but please don't panic and overreact. As I said yesterday, there, there are no sacred cows in this strategic planning process, and if you don't like that, I'm sorry. Okay. We're trying to look at the priorities of the overall organization and make some hard decisions over the next year. We're trying to figure out how to bring in more money so we can do more. And we're going to do the best job we know with a lot of input from all of you. And then we're going to move forward from there. So just ease up a little, if I could ask you, on this meeting issue. It's one issue. We've heard you. We've responded. The council passed a motion on the desire to always have two meetings. That's all we can do right now, okay? When we get through the planning process, we'll fill you in more. But again, right now, as you heard, our goal is to have two meetings a year. We've got to figure out how to do that. Or if that doesn't work, we'll come back and talk. To you. This is a <laughs> changing topic, actually. Uh, it's just a, a curiosity of my, my, you've done some really nice uh, presentation on where the worldwide membership is. Mm. Uh, but it strikes me that it'd be very interesting, and maybe you've done it, to see what the, what the US map looks like using a GIS system and looking at the population and where that relates to population centers or uh, astronomy data that we can get from sky and telescope or anything like that. I do have that, I don't have it with me. Okay. I, I do have a map actually of the world where there are uh, observers, members, non-observer members. Um, it turns out there is a very even distribution of everybody across the United States, if you're focusing in the US. Um, so there's no specific preference. I don't find that a lot of our members are in rural areas because where the telescopes are, it's fantastic. Uh, I do understand that there's some members who are non-observers in urban areas because they just can't observe, but they support citizen science. But everything else in between. So there's no indication of any uh, bias. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay, thank also, you. there's observers who are observing their telescopes are not located where they are. Sure. Good point. Yes. That's true. All right. So I think that we are all ready for a second cup of coffee. So let's break for 15 minutes, please, and let's continue your program and our discussion. Thank you.
we're caffeinated, we're energized, re-energized. I've been having chocolate-covered espresso beans since 8 this morning, so I'm quite awake. Uh, so let's get started with uh, acknowledging individuals' contributions. And with that, I would like to ask for our president to come and give a word, please. And um, Elizabeth, could you please help me? Thank you very much. And I, yeah. and I would like to start with a special award uh, to Jody Baker Maloney. Uh, she's been working on our Choice B Star uh, course for a long time now. And she's been providing a lot of uh, uh, feedback to her uh, students and to people who want to use uh, VSTAR. So we'd like to acknowledge her and uh, reward her with this special award um, because it's really very important. Our choice courses are extremely important. VFOD is a very essential part of, of the resources that we're providing to our research community. And it's really very important to acknowledge those who make it happen. She's not here right now, so we're going to send her her certificate. But... Let's acknowledge her by kind of a, a round of applause. The second person we'd like to acknowledge and honor, actually, is um, Professor Arlo Landau. Um, Arlo, thank you so much for all your work with the journal over the last couple of years, looking into its statistics, looking into the community that it serves, citations, and actually being very involved with identifying an amazing new editor-in-chief. So would you like to come up, please, and pick up your award? So perhaps Gordon can read the citation. Can I have the microphone, please? <laughs> The formal wording is in recognition for his dedication, long service to the AABSO Council, and exceptional work with the JAABSO, leading to the identifying of our new editor-in-chief. And I just want to add a personal comment. I have gotten to know Arlo so much better over the last year since I've, the last two years, really, since I've been on the council and been president. Always good ideas always worrying about the organization, always worrying about what we're accomplishing. Yeah. I think he is a remarkable individual and I'm very proud to present him this award. Wonderful. So moving on to observer awards. Um, we had 40 visual observers who have been awarded, uh, who reached a milestone this year, uh, four PEP observers, one uh, PV observer, 20 DSLR observers, 58 uh, CCD observers. And from those categories, uh, the individuals who are here are the ones who are named here. So perhaps we can start with Greg Conrad, who reached 1,000 DSLR observations, and we have his certificate, his award here. So thank you. Eric Dolls, 50,000 CCD observations. Gordon, half a million observations. Congratulations, you did it. <laughs> Ray Tomlin, half a million observations. Jerry Samolik. 700,000. Where's Jerry? <laughs> uh, Sean Vorak, so wonderful to see you in person here. One million observations. And Josh Hamsch, who put three million observations. All right, wonderful. So with that, we're gonna to move to the Solar Awards. And I have to say, you recognize the dedication when you see something like this. This is the sun this past year. This is what more than 100 people were looking at this past year, reporting nothing. And zero is a number, actually. And it's a very valuable number in order to understand the behavior of this crazy star that we call our own. 
Um, so we had uh, 27 uh, individuals who reached milestones, 83 solar observers who were actually observing sunspots this past year. Uh, we don't have any of those individuals who reach milestones here, but we have many of those observers. So I would like to recognize everybody who is look, we're looking at this blank part of a star. And those of you who have submitted the solar observations, please stand up. Please do. It's, it's a fantastic, oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Please keep observing. It will do something eventually. I mean, I hope. If not, we're in trouble. Uh, we also have um, seed uh, observers. We have seven individuals who are getting, uh, who reach milestones this year. Uh, we are giving awards for 40 seed reports, and we have one observer who reached that milestone this year. George, come up here. So with that, uh, we have a lot of members, as we saw in, our, um, in, in Gordon's report, who are members of the ABSO for a long, long time. Uh, so there are individuals who have reached milestones of 25 and 50 years. I can't imagine how it is to, feel, to, to belong in a group for 50 years. I'm not 50 years old uh, yet, <laughs> and I will never be. Um, but at this point, we have three individuals who are here, and they, uh, they reached a 25-year milestone of being continuous members of the AVSO. We would like to present them with their pin. Um, so, Sean Vorak, could you please come up again to get your pin? 25-year pin. Uh, Tom Brittle is here. Yes. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Maria Mota. <laughs> you had no idea. Stop counting after 10. We've had an individual who have been with us for more than 50 years, loyal member for 50 years in a row, and that's Professor Horace May. Come up here. <laughs> we'll give you your 100-year pin as well. <laughs> we will, really. Uh, so with that, I know that many of you have reached those milestones, so I want everyone with a pin 25 year pin, 50 year pin, 100 year pin, stand up and let's acknowledge everybody who has been loyal members of the AVSO for 25 and 50 years. <laughs> everybody. So, with that, thank you very much for being uh, in our corner. Thank you very much for being the heart of the AVSO. Thank you very much for giving us a reason to be employed. Um, thank you very much for giving us a reason to serve a community, because those of us who work in nonprofits want to serve this community. Uh, and with that, we're gonna to move to business. Um, and I'm gonna leave it to our president, because really, this is not fun anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, council elections. The, I better put my glasses on. <laughs> the, our four new council members for this year are David Cowell, Michael Cook, Joyce Guzik, and Bob Massey. Well, Joyce is on the phone with y'all, please. How many are here that can stand? Any of here? Congratulations. It's yes. And to the other people who ran, I really appreciate them running for being member of council. Um, this, this whole process, I think, is. Uh, crucial to the organization and as, as we said yesterday and constantly today keep talking to council members because that's where we get the information and insight into what's going on in the organization as we go through this planning process and looking to the future okay the second whoops okay now i'm going either the wrong way oh that'll do it that'll do it okay you shouldn't have given me control i should not give you okay. control okay um, on the bylaws, uh, the, the vote is in favor 133 to 7. 
So uh, hopefully, I think we've got a really good basis in the revised bylaws to move forward with. Hopefully, a lot of the questions that surfaced were answered and people understood what we're doing. But uh, very, very glad that to have the bylaw uh, changes in place and we are no longer a council, we are now a board. <laughs> I, I will say this is kind of a humorous thing. I did not point out yesterday in that incorporation document from 1918 that they were as confused back then as, as we have been. They said they were both directors and council, and I thought it was very strange wording in the incorporation document. Okay, we will have our discussion now about strategic planning. Do you really trust me with this? Oh, I, yeah, yes. I guess, I guess, just an oversight. Uh, the council each year, the officer positions on the council um, are elected on the board. <laughs> now I'm gonna be messed up. The council, the officers are elected each year. The terms are, are one year long. Um, and this year, uh, they, primarily the, I'm remaining on as president. Um, Bill Stein is, is first vice president. Richard Berry is second vice president. So they have all remained on the council uh, in their current positions. And you may know there's an evolution with Chris Larson. She's been our acting secretary, past president for the past year. Now formally, she's no longer past president and she has volunteered to continue on as our secretary and we're very pleased to have her as a secretary of the board. So, it's great to have everybody involved. Our treasurer quit after the presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, and Bob Stevens is staying on as our treasurer. And I, I will tell you, having a certified, uh, somebody who really understands accounting and numbers really helps the organization. So, Bob, sorry. Sorry about that. Sir. Okay, so. Um, the rest of this morning is really meant to give you some feedback from yesterday's discussion. Uh, as you remember, we had different board members <laughs> standing at the, uh, at the flip charts going through some of the key questions. So I want to ask them to each come up and talk through very quickly um, the responses that they, they heard. Um, and then I don't that maybe take, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. But feel free now to interact as they talk to you and tell you what they heard. If there's additional comments, et cetera, this is meant to be a time to talk through some of those items. Okay, Bob and Ken, if you want to talk, come up for a second and talk about these. Um, okay, there's, there's, I'm not much of a data analyst. I'm more of a poet. So when I have a whole lot of interesting information, I, one of the key themes that, uh, that came out to me in this subject of guiding and supporting new observers uh, was that each new observer is an individual. It's awful tempting in an organization of this size and its importance to think in terms of procedures and processes and systems. But each new observer is an individual coming in with their own interests, their own experience, their own background, their own equipment, uh, and their own capabilities. And, and so the person who comes up and, and says, who is the AVSO and what is a variable star and why do we do it? You need to deal with them probably first by asking questions to learn who they are and then offer them help. Um, mentoring rather than teaching. Uh, we have a whole lot of reference material which is invaluable but needs to sometimes be put in context and figure out which, which thing or things is right. Um, I learned from, from the discussions with people that helped us with this flip chart that much, many more of you all are actually being mentors than are signed up for the AVSO mentor program. Uh, well, that's, you know, we all, I'm not either, and I probably, to my shame, haven't signed up as a mentor. Um, but we may need to, to think how that mentor program works and how to, to better connect 
new observers with seasoned observers. Um, in, in working with the new observers, uh, I think everybody pointed out uh, that what we want to emphasize is, is the fun, the, the, hey, you can see something you've never seen before sort of aspect, uh, and the fact that it's of scientific value for a lot of people might be something that has to grow on them. Uh, uh, in, in dealing with the, the beginning observers, uh, quite a few people emphasize the notion of start with what they have, whether that's an eyeball or binoculars or a, a plane wave 24, uh, you know, start with what you have and, and get them out observing somehow. Um, and observing might be in, a, in the most general sense possible. I, I was reminded by Gordon's talk that a lot of you have the same color hair I do, and, and we are children of Sputnik and Apollo. But the, the people who are going to be taking our places over the next 20 years, they are children of Apple and the Internet, and that's a whole different universe. Uh, their observing may not be eyeball to eyepiece. It may be interrogating databases. It may be operating remote robotic telescopes. Um, help them figure out how they fit in here. Uh, and almost everybody emphasized uh, in the spirit of you've, you're going to see something you've never seen before, uh, to have uh, ideas for one-night stands, where you see a star change. High amplitude delta scooties, W UMA eclipsing binary, ALGOL. How many, how many of you have actually seen ALGOL go into eclipse? So that's maybe a quarter of us <laughs> in the variable star organization. <laughs> uh, all you need is an eyeball and a clear evening. Um, we also got some interesting experiences uh, that, that some of you have had uh, in, in helping new observers. Uh, one of you mentioned that uh, you gave a talk at your local astronomy club, and, and the, the conclusion of it was, let's all adopt this variable star, and let's all observe it in the next month. And, you know, a half a dozen people did. Uh, and, and so you have, you know, the beginnings of a, of a community of activity there. Um, we also learned that uh, by having a both scientific and a social uh, activity, for some people, recognition is really, really important. And the recognition can take many forms, you know, merit badges, uh, published papers, as Pat Boyce described yesterday. Um, I have a friend who runs a science program for mostly elementary age kids in his backyard, his telescope and his laboratory, and the hook for them is when they sign on, they get a lab coat with their name on it, and they're there for the whole semester. Um, the, the other thing variable stars can offer for the experienced astroimager is it's something useful and fun you can do on the bright nights when you can't reach that 18th magnitude galaxy. Um, could you push my button for me? Thank you. Um, there were some suggestions of how AAVSO as an organization uh, can, can contribute to this. Uh, uh, one is make sure that we're pointing people resources that we have online. The other was to uh, make sure that at the meetings, we have a mix of beginner and advanced topics. And I think the, the initiative that happened yesterday of the split sessions was a really neat step in that direction. Uh, it was suggested that we create a matrix of um, beginner stars <coughs> and equipment needed. So a person could say, I have this equipment, what makes sense for me to begin with? Um, there was uh, prompted, I think, by uh, Pat Boyce's talk, uh, uh, the idea that maybe we need a student paper friendly publication venue uh, that, that is 
may be not appropriate for JAVSO. Maybe it is. Um, one of the things that the student publications need, and Pat has lived through this a lot, is some very gentle but firm editing uh, that done properly is a real educational opportunity for the students uh, and, and the fact that they finally got through it, a real badge of honor for them. Uh, Pat, Pat had a, and, and, and Russ Janae had a group of students that uh, by the time they got their paper actually submitted to the Journal of Double Star Observation, it had been through 20 <laughs> cycles of revision and they still brag about that. <laughs> So, so you know, they, they're learning a whole lot more than science, and, and it's good for them, good for, for the scientific community. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, maybe we need to cast a broader net for, uh, for mentors who are willing, but not on the official list, because of the importance of personal content. Oh, yeah, I've more than used up my five minutes, right? <laughs> That's fine. That's good. Ken? I'll just add uh, one comment here, which is that if you think about each of these items, there are things that we as individual members can do. And then there are other things where maybe the AAVSO has to have programs in place to facilitate helping new members. But it, it is a, a joint process. And so everybody in here can do things to help uh, attract new members and help new members feel welcome and excited and have fun doing variable star astronomy. So um, as you think about it, uh, please remember there are things you can do, but also feel free to contact us with your ideas on things that the organization as a whole can do. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have you already changed it? Okay, uh, this was the second question we put up yesterday, was how to enhance support for our exper experienced observers. Bill? Okay, thank you. Uh, we didn't get a lot of comments. In fact, some are duplicates of uh, the first one. But I want to say up front that when I first joined uh, the AVSO, I went to the mentoring program, and it really helped me on uh, CVs. Tom Krejci was uh, my mentor. He guided through guided me through many of uh, my observations and showed me how to correct them properly and so on. So I think the mentoring program is really important to all of our members. So uh, the first one here is very similar to the uh, first question or first comments, dual tracks at meetings. So the suggestion here is that uh, we may want to have separate workshops that are more for uh, the beginners and more for the advanced. So I think that's a good idea. I think we have tried to do that in this uh, uh, particular meeting also. And then maybe talks for beginners, maybe a separate session just for beginners for talks, and then a separate session more for advanced talks. That's another suggestion we got. Um, most of us who submit our observations like to have feedback too. And I think that's something that maybe uh, either the AAVSO or the professional astronomers can do a little better. Uh, with me in cataclysmic variables, I also belong to the CBA, Center for Backyard Astrophysics. That's uh, Professor uh, Patterson, Joe Patterson. He's very good at sending feedback to the observers about his campaign, letting us know how well our observations are doing and when we can stop too. So if we can do something like that within the AVSO or from the alerts that are sent out, those come from sometimes professional astronomers. We submit uh, our observations to support the alert. It might be good then to get some feedback. How good were our observations? Are they useful to you? And perhaps uh, when we make a uh, alert request, we make sure that part of that is that the person who submits the alert has to also give feedback. That could be an easy thing to do, but they might need a nudge. So it's maybe the responsibility of the staff 
to also send a reminder to the astronomer professional. Let's uh, give some feedback to our or to our uh, observers. Yesterday we had uh, some sectional meetings, and I think they were uh, well attended and well received. And so the comments I'm receiving from that is uh, we'd like to have that continue maybe longer uh, section meetings and breakout sessions in the future at some of our meetings. So those were the comments I received. I don't know if anyone else has comments they'd like to make for the experienced uh, observers here. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just add to what Bill was saying. One thing, if for the professional astronomers, in the audience. This feedback thing, when I, when I talked to professionals and was trying to find out why they didn't really provide the feedback we wanted, a lot of them said, well, it takes me a year to do the research and analysis, and you know, it's a year later. And the point I would make, that's not the type of feedback, I mean, not that we don't like to hear that, but a lot of the feedback is just, hey, the observations are what I needed. Hey, I'm doing the analysis. It, it's a quick email. I mean, Joe Patterson, who's the one we always almost revere when these conversations, because he's been so successful communicating with a group of amateurs on the cataclysmic variables, his emails are very informal. They can be frequent or infrequent, depending upon how busy he is. But I've just urged the professionals, hey, just, just a quick email, you know, a five minute email. Hey, here's what's going on. I appreciate what we got. That, that would really be, be appreciated by many of our observers. Okay, Richard, how can we better engage members who do not submit observations? Thanks. Um, I stood at, at my flip chart and almost nobody came by. Um, but because I knew this was coming along, I've talked to a number of people who I know are members who I know do not submit observations. Um, of the membership, something like 50%, actually a little bit more than 50, I think 54% um, are members whose primary reason for belonging to the AVSO is to support either monetarily or simply by being a member, a scientifically significant organization, probably the most significantly um, uh, important um, amateur uh, citizen science uh, organization in astronomy. Um, so some of the things uh, I've got from talking to a variety of different people um, up to, and then also a little bit last night at the AVSO meeting, um, it really comes down, I think, to a time problem. Do I have time to spend two or three hours each evening preparing to do observations. And I don't want to, um, my good friend who has done a lot of work, for instance, doing Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams and stuff and working with students, um, when he does a group of observations of a, of a star with students, he's not sure enough, sure enough that that has been done well enough he doesn't want to put the data in the database. In other words, he can't certify it's been done right. Um, but the other thing he said was, I don't want to get into something that's going to take me all my observing time for the next two years. Um, and he said, why don't we have little things where an announcement comes out, there's something we really need to look at intensively for the next month. I jump on that. He says, because, you know, and when we talk about members who are not submitting organizations, <coughs> I mean, observations, we're not talking about people who don't observe. We're talking about people who observe asteroids um, or who are doing spectroscopy, in my case, of lunar eclipses and stuff like that. Other weird, interesting projects I've taken up instead of doing this, um, instead of doing um, Variable stars. The other thing is when I've worked with, with variable stars at Pine Mountain Observatory, um, 
we ended up getting, I think, 5,000 observations of star XX Cygni over a course of, of, of four nights, very dense multicolor observations. Um, I was never sure whether the time base was accurate. So with that kind of observation, all you're looking for is the time of max. Um, those were ultimately um, submitted to um, the Hungarian database. So the key things I think to get people who probably have the capability, who have the knowledge of how to do variable star astronomy, present them with opportunities to get into something they can work on intensively for a month or so. Foreground intensive projects um, such as ANOVA goes off. Um, and when that notice comes out, don't just say, don't make it look like an IAU announcement. Um, make it easy to get through the stuff. A little paragraphs talking about, from the investigator, talking about why this is going to be a significant observation. In other words, get my attention, get that person's attention. Then provide the chart so I don't have to go out and look it up. Um, you know, is this doable? Is it going to work? Um, the recommended comp stars. This would actually help everybody because then everybody would be using the same comp stars and we'd have better data. Um, Another possibility is emphasize projects that require minimal equipment. Uh, this is the camera on a stick like Jerry Smolak has been doing. Um, why? Because it's going to be fun to do it. It doesn't get you into a lot of, I'm going to use up all my telescope time when I really want to do something else with the telescope. Um, coming out of the AVSO net, for example, um, and early on, provide some sample learning data sets for people who are not quite sure they know how to do this. So, you know, here's a six month run, you know, it's, a, it's out there in the Dropbox of our LIRI stuff so that they can just sit there and practice on it um, and build that confidence that, okay, I can do this. I've done it before now on the data. I've got to do that. Um, for AVSONET, proposals seem to be, if, you, if you're not submitting observations because you're in a place where the sky is not right or your telescope broke or whatever, whatever reason you're not doing that, an AVSONET seems like a good thing. Then you say, oh, I have to write a proposal. Provide some sample proposals because there's a lot of people who don't know exactly what a proposal looks like. Well, it turns out it's a short paragraph saying I want to do X, um, but provide some. And then, okay, I'll just pick a star and I will run a sample program just to get into it. AVSO has a lot of time on those telescopes. And if you've done one project, you're going to do more because once you get into this stuff, it's really fascinating. And then one comment that I've heard from people who um, would like to, to join or would like to submit is, I can't figure out where on the website I can find out what to do. Okay, and I know that we're, we're planning to, in discussing with the CAT, yes, the CAT people, the, these, these Harvard guys who are very, very smart people, looked at our website and they went like, what is this? Well, yeah, I mean, when we, even Stella does not navigate the website. She has fixed go-tos that you can click on to get the spots on the website. The website's not easy to use. Priorities in that website are not easy to find. People, it's possible we have people who are not observing because they can't figure out, oh, where do I start? That, that website will never settle because that's probably the this reality anymore. Okay, uh, question four. Bob. On the SAS board, we have three of five boards. So it's 
Bob B and Bob G. And now we've got three populating the AA. So it's going to be Bob S, Bob B, and Bob M, I'm sure. Um, on this, like Richard, we had almost nobody actually come by and write anything down and, and give us any op observations. But I have a lot of observations myself from 30 years of belonging to my club and trying to get them, you know, excited about this, the more sciencey side of things. So, um, but one person did come and suggest and, uh, that we work through the Astronomical League who has a, a nice list of clubs. And I think that's something that we can actually do there. And then um, maybe somehow contact some of those clubs. But what I was thinking about all this time, and it actually didn't get written down in such a way, and when we're talking about engaging clubs, media, when I think of media, I don't think of newspapers and websites and stuff like that, because that costs a lot of money, and it's really hard to make an impact there anymore. I think more in terms of social media and things like that, and in fact, we are now starting a much more formal program. And that has to be done at the organizational level. So it's, but that doesn't mean that we as individuals can't participate in that. Um, let's face it, none of us are Kim Kardashian. We'll never pr profess to be, but that doesn't mean that we can't post and respond when we see stuff on the AAVSO uh, Facebook page or Twitter account or Instagram account or whatever. Like it. Just hit the like button, you know. Show of hands, how many of you are on social media? Okay, okay. so let me be specific. How many of you are on Facebook? Okay. How many of you are on Twitter? How many of you are on Instagram? Okay. How many of you know what Slack is? Okay, all right. You know, so we're looking at two-thirds the audience out there, and like most people, we're just... We, we get 10 minutes a night to look at this sort of stuff and we're just scrolling on by as fast as we can. But when you see something posted by the ABSO, hit the like button, call attention to your friends and family and fellow club members who you're friends with and so on and so forth, that will help. Now, what I thought was gonna get up here and nobody actually read, wrote down, but engaging clubs is, we most of us belong to a club or at least have clubs around us that we regularly attend and something like that. We can give talks from time to time. We can put stuff in the newsletter from time to time. Uh, there's often show and tell. About two or three times a year, I get up and say, oh, here's the neat little project. I do the five minute blurb on the whatever it is I just finished doing. Those are things that get people interested in more than just the pretty pictures side of things. Um, I'm not sure what the person had in mind talking about awards and recognition at the Above a media level, other than maybe we need to promote that in our in our uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook feeds at the institutional level, and this is something I thought was very was very interesting. Create little sixty second videos on our website, our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel, by the way. It's full of fascinating things like the Treasures Report. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not suggesting we need more content there or something, but this person is saying we need to get some exciting people out there excited about science to talk about how this is really cool and just little things that people have the sh with short attention spans can see and can be linked to club websites and all sorts of stuff like that. So that's what I've got. <laughs> I'll try to keep this relatively quick because we're standing between you and lunch. So some of the things that were on Bob's bosom board deeply apply to communicating with the general public. Some of them apply even almost better. Uh, for instance, the only reason why the YouTube 60 second video wasn't on here was because it was on the previous slide. I think actually we've got a, a lot of capacity within our group to have a lot of passionate people take out their smartphone, turn it on themselves, and just tell us why you're passionate about variable stars. Put it online, 
and then we can start sharing some of this stuff. We got more, we had more things on our board than just these three, but these were three that I just wanted to call out because I thought some of them were um, a little bit outside of the normal things we think about. One of them is, yes, the AVSO does ads, but our ads don't actually talk about specific things like you too can watch as a star go a phase and brightens by a factor of 100 or something like this that is a little bit more specific and makes it clear how people can actually participate. Uh, another thing was many of us are members in other things that aren't after groups but can be related. In particular, uh, Bob S. brought up the point that the Audubon Society has binoculars that they use during the day. They're probably going to be interested in using binoculars at night. So maybe give some talks about astronomy to these non-astronomy groups. And as a member, you don't have to get AAVSO headquarters uh, uh, you know, blessing to give a talk about it, your work, or the AAVSO, or whatever. So you can be an active part of this. This is really what we can be doing, not just what a, uh, headquarters can be doing. Um, and one thing that was pointed out was, how many of you guys have heard about Silent Sky? So about 20%. Silent Sky is a play that is based off of Henrietta Leavitt's experiences as a Harvard computer. It is a story of AAVSO. It is a story, not the story, but a story of AAVSO. And he raised, the person raised the point was, you know, if you had it, I thought you had a place. Was AAVSO there? Was a member from AAVSO there? And I just went like this. Literally, Silent Sky was at my town last week. And no, I wasn't there. If you don't, uh, as we learned earlier in, in the talk, she is responsible for understanding the relationship between period, the period of brightness uh, variations or Cepheid variables, which basically sets how we understand how big the universe is. So, but we also have other things like planetary, et cetera, and maybe we need to have more of a presence, whether this is both unofficial presences or perhaps official presences, an AAVSO poster that we could send out to planetaria and the like to really drum up uh, some support from the general public. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, very short and sweet. <clears throat> and I'm just the messenger here, so don't shoot about maintain LCG1 or equivalent versus oh, LCG2. Yeah. So the main takeaway of that is LCG1 is a very basic light field generator. People need the quick response time of it. I'm interested in one object, I want to see it fast. I don't need all this feature-rich stuff that LCG2 is providing. Having said that, there's folks that want that. So the whole idea is not one versus the other, but takeaway was and dare forbid I say this, LCG3, but uh, that the user can toggle on and off the features that's conducive to their use. So I can maybe defaults to some middle area or defaults to the simplest thing, and I can turn features on and off as, as I want. So that was, that was the, uh, the slide talk there around the, around the easel. And the other one was uh, tools for uh, min max cycle, this is timings, the eclipsing variables, and LPBs and stuff like that, and just their tools for those areas there. And that was basically it. Workshop topics. Many of the presentations just concluded have given ideas for our different workshop. The two that were brought to our <laughs> Uh, one was on spectroscopy, and of course, there's going to be a spectroscopy uh, function made in in uh, the next meet, in the next meeting in November. Uh, data mining, and the important part of this idea was that it's how-to techniques. You want to know how to do these things, rather than just have a discussion of data mining and all the nice things you can achieve with it. Um, something else that has come up in conversations are Manuscripts, how to write a paper for the JAVSO. There are many interesting posters given at our meetings. There are many interesting talks given at our meetings. The majority of those never ever see the light of day of the manuscript. 
And that's a real shame because if people have done good work, data reduced properly, they're yeah, important, right the they should get there. out. But talking to people over the years I've been around the AVSO, people say, well, I, I'm just not comfortable writing a paper. I've not done that. I've not done this. You all can do it. And so probably, perhaps, a workshop would be happy, would be helpful in some how-to general comments, uh, not have to take hours, but uh, an hour or so to talk about what one does in preparing a manuscript for a submission to the JAVSO. Uh, another kind of how-to a workshop, perhaps, uh, that's come up was, I've got data, I've got a new program I'm writing, and I've got a few versions of the program, and each version gives a different result. How do I know when my program gives the results that are correct and that could be submitted to wherever? And perhaps a workshop along these lines would be useful in that people should know, help point out to them that you go to the literature of a similar project, because the JAVSO has got tables of data in it, or you can find other journals that have tables of data for times the minimum or whatever like that. And you can study their characteristics. Uh, you can study the, the uh, quality of the period presented. Use your program on those published data, and your program will is working if you get the same result as the published value assuming that that author did it properly. Anyway, uh, there's, there are quite a variety of these workshops that could be done, and these are the two that specifically came up yesterday. Okay, we're, we're really backed up against lunchtime, and I'm trying to confirm one thing. Are we gonna do a group photo now? Okay, so we're gonna do a group photo where do, I, where do we send people? Before you all run away, I just wanted to thank everybody. I just wanted to thank everybody for the feedback. Feel free to contact all of us if we're going through this activity over the next year. Thank you very much.